first time I heard y'all, uh, actually your publicist got in contact with me. And we never heard y'all before, and I heard y'all the Cry Little Sister. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, whenever I first heard that song, I categorized y'all as like, okay, it's an alternative rock, you know, veins of. Uh, in the veins of like Nickelback, Three Days Grace, things like that. But then whenever I listened to the album, I was like, whoa, this is a lot more heavier, a lot, you know, bigger uh, category. We get that a lot, and I think some of that's due to the radio edit, some of it's due to the fact that it's a cover song, some of it's due to the fact that, you know, it, it's not, I don't know, it, 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 there's a lot of different things that contribute to that, but yes, we are a heavy metal band. Yeah. and. Uh, Sometimes that song is not indicative of that. Yeah, well, whenever I thought about it, it was like, well, with the, that song, it can bring in the chicks. And then when they say, you know, don't like the rest of the album, well, at least their right. boyfriends or husbands right. or brothers will get into the music. To be honest, I try to write all the music with that thought in mind anyway, that, that it's for everybody, because to be honest, girls don't want to hear you yelling in their face for 10 hours, you know what I mean? Or five minutes. <laughs> so, I mean, a little melody mixed with your metal ain't a bad deal, you know? Cool. All right, um, another interesting thing that caught my attention was the lyrical content. Uh, like 1111, uh, which I felt talked about rising above your struggles and standing for, you know, what's inside you. Tell us a little bit about that track and is there any significance to 1111? Well, Okay, when I wrote it, I had no idea about this whole 1111 thing that's on the internet. If you, if you Google it, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's weird stuff. I had no idea that was out there. My thought about 1111 was like uh, the, the 11th hour. You know, I, I don't know if you know anything about theology, but uh, um, you know, waiting till the final hour is. is you know, that's tempting. That's yeah. tempting fate. You know what I'm saying? And that's basically what that is. It's like, you can't wait till the final hour. It may never arrive. Yeah, that's why in some of your music, it's, you know, living today. Yes. You know, don't yes. worry. You don't know what's going to happen. Exactly. Tomorrow. You don't know when that bus is going to jump the curb. Yeah. Um, on other songs, I felt that it was like despair, yet hope, and, and you know, and strength in them. Um, there's, there's a bit of a spiritual content with them, yet in parts, like a disconnect from them. Very much so. Uh, I'm very impressed at, at your analysis of some of this already. I'm like kind of blown away. This is already deeper than most dudes want to tread as far as lyrical content and stuff. Yes, I, I'm, I'm very impressed, man. I'm flattered. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, that's one thing whenever I was growing up, I liked reading lyrics. And that, it also helped me it's a with big my part of buying the CD, man. You sit down, you fold it up. It's like the whole digital thing blows my mind because you don't, you don't yeah. get to experience that. You know, I, I, I still have records. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> so I, I'm totally with you on that. The lyrical content is a huge part, and being a singer, that's. I mean, if I don't stand on that, what do I have to stand on? Yeah, you know? definitely. Um, like on, on your own. You know, the lyrics, I felt a connection to something else, to something bigger than myself. I felt it pull away and it hasn't returned still to this day. And I believe that at one point in everybody's life they felt that hopelessness. Yeah. No matter if you believe in God or Allah or nothing. You yeah. Felt, you felt like there was something there for a second and then maybe not. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for some people it sticks it, with them and yeah. they go forward with it. Yeah. And I, I don't honestly and truly feel like that all the time, but I felt like that sometimes, man. I mean, we've all we've all had that lonely feeling in the corner, you know what I mean? Which yeah. is like, gosh, it's just me now. <laughs> How did you get um, into singing, into you know, doing what you're doing now? I was very lucky at a young age. I had a music teacher pull my parents aside and say, you know, he can he can sing. And if you want him to, he can, he can be good at it. And they never really pushed me, but they always supported me. And, and I was very lucky, so throughout, that started when I was probably 10 or 11. So throughout junior high and then high school and on into college, I, I worked on it. I was in choir and, and went to contests and did that, took voice lessons. I had very, very good teachers in high school. But I've, I've just been very fortunate all the way through. And then 
after college, I decided that I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to see in a rock band, so <laughs> it kind of it kind of evolved into that. That'll work. Um, you said you mentioned about starting out whenever you're like 10 or 11 years old. Being that young, how how would you go about telling somebody, you know, a, a young person, you know, she's interested in drums and everything. You know, to, what would you tell a young person in dealing with following their, you know, their life stream or following their, what they're interested in at that moment? To be honest, to tell, what I would say to, to a young person would be continue with your education stick with that because that's the most important thing no matter what happens is with music you have to have something to fall back on and if you don't have an education you're gonna starve in a van and then when that van runs out of gas <laughs> you hope it's at the next venue exactly <laughs> and you hope you're getting paid really well that night <laughs> no I I would encourage anybody that's in, that wants to be involved in music because it will it will enrich your life it'll make your life better you'll, you'll see things differently you'll feel things differently um, music affects you on a different level than just mere communication, just words, you know. Uh, music can make people cry with just notes. So, uh, I w I'm not discouraging you at all from music at all, but make sure you have that solid background with your education first. But definitely make sure you have that. <laughs> Sorry, I have three kids, so I'm very oh, really? firm on that. <laughs> That's um, we were talking about the lyrics earlier. And it also goes into the name Seasons After. Uh, it seems to have, you know, getting past the changes and what one goes through in life, elaborate on that, you know, on the name. Well, uh, it was kind of a poem that Dawson wrote. Um, he kind of had an idea about this long before he assembled us and, and figured out what guys were even going to be in this band. He had kind of a vision about the first album and, and a vision about the name and kind of what he wanted this whole thing to stand for from the very beginning. So. It, 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 this is Dawson's dream, man. This is his. This is his vision. And to be honest, I would. I wouldn't be the right person to even explain all of that. But but it's about what you. What you're seeing. I mean, it's about what you feel about surviving and getting through the next day and, and realizing that there will be seasons after the, all of this terrible stuff that may be happening to you right now. There's another. There's another segment there's another part that comes after that yeah. you just got to get through this part yeah i've seen the tattoo that uh michael had on yep. his arm and he mentioned that's that. that's the bone it wraps all the way around his arm Sweet. i think uh we all have a few of them i've got one dawson has I, I don't know who all has one now i think we all have one now cool. um dealing with your album uh through tomorrow um Actually, it was a re-release on Warner Music um, Group. Was there any difference in the prior release to the label release? Yeah, we went back and remixed some things. Uh, we had another guitarist previous to Jimmy being in the band, and he went back in and uh, uh, put some solos down and did some parts that he wanted to put on. And uh, I did a little couple things that they wanted done for radio edits and stuff like that. I did a remix. Um, Joe Marlette's the guy that did all Blink 182's his albums. He's, he's worked with a ton of people, and the list goes too far for me to even start dropping names. So um, he he got a hold of it, and it sounds it sounds like it came out on Warner Brothers now. You know, I mean, it's a it's Dirtbag ILG Warner Warner Music Group. So yeah, I've seen that. Uh, you get you have the shirts on. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Gotta represent. Man, I do not want to cut you short, but okay, yeah, I am going to have to get out there and stage at some Okay, point. no problem. Um, any final words and everything, you know, dealing with your fans, dealing with anything else? Can you get out there? Gosh, what do you mean final words? That sounds so final. <laughs> uh, just thank everybody for supporting us. I mean, we're a bunch of hardworking boys from Kansas that are just out here busting our tails. and. Hoping to entertain some people and I hope they get it, man. That's that's all we're trying to do.